Good morning, everyone. So, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our second day of showcase. Uh, we hope you enjoyed yesterday's program. Uh, we anticipate we'll have a pretty good day today. We'll hear from um, our two remaining 2018 Next Gen leaders. Um, and we'll have lightning talks from three more veteran NGLs today. Um, in addition, we'll have three more team talks covering neural reconstruction at the whole brain level, the um, brain observatory, and our informatics team. So um, with that, let's get started. Great. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first uh, NGL speaker. Um, it's uh, Dr. Keith Hengen, uh, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he's been there since 2017. Uh, his lab concentrates on how neural networks generate robust computation and dynamics over long periods of time. Uh, Keith did his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his postdoctoral work with uh, Gina Tur uh, uh, Turgiano at Brandeis, um, where he developed methods for his very long-term recording uh, of uh, single neurons in freely behaving animals. Um, so his current research makes use of this technology, and he's going to talk about some of that work today. Um, in a talk titled Robo Robust Computation in Complex Networks Across a Lifetime. Uh, please welcome me and welcoming Keith. <laughs> Thank you very much. Set up my, my timer here. Okay. All right. Otherwise, I get lost in time and I start to worry that I'm going over. So, um, thank you for the kind introduction. And I, I think before I start, I, I should say thank you. Um, I'm at a bit of a loss for words, so we can, we can leave it at that, because I, I find myself in the NGL now and, and sort of surprised that I'm lumped under the same label, because I look around and I see all of these sort of you know, brilliant and productive and, and, and friendly people. That's an, you know, quite the group. And then I, then I step back a little bit and I see the, the Allen as a, as a nexus, I guess, of brilliant, friendly, and productive people. So it's, it's an honor to be here, and thank you very, very much for the opportunity. So, so, so with that, the, um, as mentioned, the, the sort of guiding light or the north star, star, so to speak, for my laboratory is an understanding of how neural networks generate robust computation and dynamics across, you know, in humans, decades or in rats and mice, potentially years. Um, in other words, how is it even remotely possible that any neural function, that could be you know, behavior, cognition, sensation, perception, that any, any of these functions is possibly stable and reliable across a, a lifetime of, of change. Um, so I think a good introduction to this problem, or to the set of questions, is, is something that I like to call the, the stability problem. So if you consider a neural network, this is just a generic neural network, inhibition, excitation, recurrent connectivity, et cetera, it has a simple job, and that is to, to transmit or transform information. So if we put something into the bottom end of the network, we expect to get the same thing or a faithful transformation of it out the, the business end of this network. And that's that's harder to do than it is to say, because uh, if on average the, the, the gain of connection strength across this network is slightly greater than one, that is to say the, the ratio of the output from a layer to, to the input of that layer, then the, layer, the information will explode. Spiking activity will explode. The system will saturate. And there is no information contained at the output layer. You cannot derive what went into this network by looking at what comes out of the network. And you face the same problem as you might predict if you look at a network whose gain is ever so slightly less than one. Here, the signal degrades. Um, and, and, and once again, there's no way to tell what, goes in, what went in by looking at what comes out. Right? So, so the, the obvious solution that you know, I'm setting you up to say is, well, OK, you go in and, and, and set it so that the mean gain across these networks is one. And theoretically, that would work perfectly. It's a computationally appropriate solution. I don't know how you would do it, how you'd actually implement that sort of complex of a program. But, but the, 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 the immediate problem with the solution is that, um, that I, I know where the bathroom is. Uh, and that's for less salacious reasons than you might think. It's for the fact that I have learning. Right? And so the, the, the ability to, to rapidly encode where the bathroom is or where my hotel is goes uh, according to the sort of um, you know, our mechanistic understanding of learning memory goes against the rule we just imposed. The way that we have experienced dependent plasticity is by changing the gain of the connections across this network constantly and very rapidly. So now we have a much more pernicious problem to face. We want networks that are simultaneously stable and reliable in their sort of higher order dynamics, and we want to have rapidly modifiable synapse-specific plasticity. So a solution that has been suggested for decades to this problem is, is uh, 
to imbue every neuron in this network with its own ability to homeostatically regulate its output. Now, I, I'm well aware that there are members of this audience who will fall asleep on command when I utter the word homeostasis. And I, I urge you to, to check that instinct for a moment because from a logically derived sort of computational understanding of how networks must work, you need, we require a homeostatic or compensatory process in order to enable learning, memory, and experience-dependent development. So the, the, the reason that this is such a long-standing question, for decades we've had some beautiful work emerge on putative mechanisms that may give rise to this, but the reason that the, the, the actual sort of, I don't know, proof, if you will, that, that neurons have firing rate homeostasis, the reason that was elusive is because the time scales of homeostasis are so great. Right? We, we, we know from the mechanistic expression that, that we need to be able to follow the activity of neurons for days to weeks in order to really nail this down. And so, as mentioned by Matt in my kind introduction, this is what I developed primarily as a postdoc. So um, let me show you the tool, and then we'll apply it to the question. So, so here is uh, a, a plot of two clusters collected on a single wire across nine days of recording. And if you're not familiar with, with clustering, the basic idea is that each point here represents a single action potential or spike collected on the wire. Um, and I've colored each of these points as a function of when the spike was collected. And what I want you to see is that there is not, there is not a drift in color from, from purple to teal or from yellow to pink in these clusters. They, are, they seem stable. There's noise in the system, but they're stable around a center. We can plot the centroids of these clusters, and you can see nine centroids and nine centroids. These clusters are stable over time. Here are nine mean waveforms from the nine days of recording of each of these clusters. I can peak scale them to account for a couple microvolt drift, overlay the nine waveforms from cluster one and cluster two, Summarily, I can follow every single spike that an individual neuron fires for, well, now months, but in this case, nine days continuously. And so I can take this method and apply it to the question of whether or not individual neurons have effectively a thermostat. Right? You can think about this like, a, like your house. You set it at 70 degrees, and, and the question is, can the house regulate itself around that? If we open a window in February and we let in cold air, can you kick on a thermos and sort of claw your way back to 70 degrees? And so I nominate that, that the, the rodent visual system is the ideal system in which to ask these questions uh, in, in an intact brain in a freely behaving animal. And that is largely because the eyes are so highly lateralized. And what that means is we can, we can open that window. We can let in the cold air by occluding vision to one eye. Because in the rodent, the left visual field is almost exclusively accounted for by the left eye, which leaves the right, the right visual field in that stream largely intact. So we implant multi-electrode arrays bilaterally into monocular V1, and then we record for nine days. Right? We let the animal do its thing. So here, here are two individual neurons, uh, you'll, and I should point out this is 12 hours of light, dark, light, dark, and so forth. We have multiple orders of magnitude and kind of the baseline levels of activity, and you can see that these cells operate somewhat stably at baseline, and then we occlude vision to one eye uh, after lights go off on the third day of activity. And then we continue to follow the activity of these cells for the next uh, six days. So Mark Baer's lab has elegantly shown that this initial depression in activity uh, is caused by widespread LTD. And then the second phase of the experiment reveals a homeostatic rebound to, on average, within 15% of initial values. Right? So here we can um, average together all the cells from this condition and, and normalize them. And you see a robust effect, a 60% suppression followed by a slow homeostatic, uh, by a slow homeostatic rebound. So one of the advantages of this system, though, is that we're not studying these you know, sort of theoretical and computationally essential processes in a vacuum or a reduced preparation. So we can ask how ethology, how environment, and how brain state actually modulate and intersect with these systems. So I took advantage of this to, to test a, a hypothesis that, um, it's, you know, it's not mine, but this idea that, that you know, the purpose of sleep is actually to implement mechanisms of, of firing rate homeostasis and synaptic homeostasis because we have thousands of, of, of instances of sleep and wake in these animals. So the way we run this analysis, let me just walk you through kind of a cartoon of this. So here is a 100-hour trace of a single neuron's firing rate. So you see the drop and it's the beginning of the rebound. And if we zoom in on this gray box here, I can plot that those 10 hours out here. I, I think I plotted it in one-minute bins and I've colored each point as a function of the behavioral state of the animal at that time. So then we can algorithmically select whatever behavioral state we're interested in, right? There's thousands of these things. So let's pick active waking for the sake of this cartoon. So let's focus on the green, the blue, and the red here. So each of these starts at a different firing rate and has a different duration. So we normalize them 
in, in, in X and Y. And then we can average those three bins together and say, what was the mean effect of active waking on the activity of this neuron at this point in the experiment? So when we turn to the control hemisphere, you can see that none of the four behavioral states systematically predicted a change in firing rate of neurons in primary visual cortex. And this is true across light and dark. Um, we do not see a change in rate. We see changes in patterns. I'll get to those types of questions later. But we do not see rate encoding of state or environment in the control hemisphere. If we turn to the deprived hemisphere, my prediction was that we would have a stepwise return. We would only see that positive slope, the, the homeostatic rebound, in the two sleep states. I predicted we would see a positive slope in, in the purple and the green traces. And um, the, the contrast to this is sort of our computational understanding that doesn't have space for sleep and wake. And in that case, you would predict that all four states should equally contribute. And when we look at the data, we see that neither of the sleep states produces any change in firing rate. And the entire homeostatic rebound is almost exclusively explained by active waking. So it's kind of turned our understanding of the system on its head. So at this point, I could go on and show you more figures from this work, but I would like to, to transition to what I'm doing with this type of experiment now in my own laboratory, because we've been up and running for a year, and we have some exciting things that I'm, I'm in the process of publishing. And so the, the, the motivating step from this to where I am now is, is actually a sort of a sense of discomfort that developed in me in thinking about these problems over the last few years. And the reason is that, 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 that my field frequently motivates the interrogation of, of um, single cell firing rate homeostasis and, and uh, compensatory plasticity mechanisms by making the argument that it will stabilize network dynamics, right? We say in a recurrent network, if you have heavy in plasticity, it introduces positive feedback and the system will explode or decay. But the, the problem is I can very easily build a stable network from unstable components. And likewise, I can build an unstable network from stable components. So the work that I've shown you does not necessarily solve the problem that we initially state to motivate the very work. So we need to consider network dynamics. So I've already described these two networks to you in terms of gain, right, in terms of sort of single cell property. So we can also describe them as sort of inhibitory regimes or excitatory regimes. You can't move information through this network, and this one explodes. Another way to say that is the, the interaction magnitude in this network is very low, right? So an individual cell doesn't have enough interaction with its neighbors to drive information through it, and the interaction magnitude here is far too great. So w w as I... To some of you in the audience, the, the term activity covariance will just immediately make sense. And to the rest of us, we can just replace that with information content or entropy, because they map onto each other. So I already told you that at these two extremes, we have no information content. And then somewhere in between, uh, a, an appropriately functioning network must emerge. So we can sort of throw some, some Gaussian curve over there. And then what we're looking for is th this intermediate interaction magnitude that produces a stable network, a reliable network that can transmit information. And, and folks in theoretical physics have asked these questions, not specifically within the context of neurons, but in complex systems in general. And they have found that there is a computationally um, sort of attractive or idealized regime uh, next at the phase transition between inhibition and excitation. So you can think about this point it doesn't necessarily emerge, but it can emerge from a system that is at this, at this transition between stability and instability. So it's the least stable of stable states. So Christoph talks about sort of this excitable tissue being the brain that explains consciousness in all of our experiences. And the idea here is we are as excitable as we can be without being too excitable and cascading into, into instability. So in a critical system, we experience maximal entropy given, given a, a fixed number of nodes in the system. We experience maximal dynamic range. Think about starting in a dark room and walking out into bright sunlight. And we also, and this is the most important part, we have scale-free dynamics. What that very roughly means is that we can move information in, on the scale of microns to many centimeters across the brain, and we can maintain information in time from, from very brief slices of time to, I, I mean, I, I'm capable of you know, ruminating on a broken heart for, for pathologically long periods of time. So we can maintain information in time. And, and, and that can occur most effectively in a scale-free system. So when we can, 
let me say this. People have probed these ideas a little bit in the brain before, but I believe unconvincingly, and so it's still a controversial idea in the field. And the problem is you need massive, massive amounts of data to make meaningful computational statements about this type of network architecture. I'm setting myself up to say I can do that, so let me show you how. And I'm going to put cliff notes on the side because this is a complicated slide and unfortunately I don't have time to like pick it apart with nuance. So the first thing that we do is we look for network events. We call them network relaxation events. And so rather than just looking at individual spikes from n number of cells, we look at the sort of coordinated spiking of many cells across a network or multiple networks. And we see that spatio-temporally clustered bursts of activity occur that are separated by periods of quiescence. And so we can kind of collapse these and consider the, uh, colloquially they're termed avalanches. We can consider avalanches in terms of their size, the number of spikes, or their duration, their you know, duration. Um, and then we can, we can look at the distributions of the, 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 the size uh, and duration of avalanches and extract power law exponents. Just having a power law does not mean that a system is critical. So we can apply a rigorous test for criticality by extracting these two power laws and predicting a specific fit of how these two distributions fit together. So the, the key point here is that using tau and alpha, we can predict a third exponent here. And then we can plot the interaction of these two distributions in purple, and we can fit them with an empirically derived exponent. And so this is, this is so if, you, if, if all of that, that's a lot of information very quickly. The key point here is that we have a novel measure now, a scalar value that tells us how far a system is from this computationally idealized regime. So the, 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 the predicted exponent is in solid gray, the data are in purple, and the fit exponent is this dashed line. So we measure DCC, the deviation from criticality coefficient. And as the system gets further and further from criticality, that, that, that value grows until it's inappropriate to even fit power law, and the thing explodes and becomes meaningless anyway. So we can then apply this measure of network dynamics. OK, right, so we're assessing this deviation from predicted. So we can apply this measure of network topology to the same exact experimental paradigm that I introduced you to already. So here, here's a, another set of experiments doing the same thing, where we suture an animal's eye. This is firing rate data. So here is the, the monocular deprivation. You can see that activity slowly decays and then comes back homeostatically, and it has no effect on the control hemisphere. So if we probe these very networks that generate this firing, these firing rate data, we can first say the system does appear to organize around criticality. It has a low DCC value. So the, the immediate questions are, is this just an epiphenomenon? Will we see, is it perturbable? Or, or is criticality just a, a side effect, inevitability of having connected neurons? And if it is perturbable, does it represent a self-organizing central attractor for network dynamics? And if it does, do the dynamics simply follow this? And I mean, they kind of should, right? We have a 60% suppression in the number of spikes in the network. So how would it be possible that network dynamics would not simply mirror the local effects, the single cell effects? But when we look at the data, what we see is remarkably different. We see that as soon as the lights come on, on that first day of deprivation, the network topology is completely scrambled. Days before we see a change, in, a significant change in firing rate. And then at the nadir of firing rate activity, of suppression, we see that the network comes back and reorganizes around criticality. It does this in a rate independent manner. It is scale free. And when we look at the control hemisphere, we see there is no effect of the, of the, of the uh, visual deprivation. So that, that, this is the type of question that my lab is interested in, and I want to apply this to, to specific behaviors, to disease states, to I, I want to understand the, the molecular and cellular mechanisms involved in creating these stable dynamics. I don't want to just wave my hands and say, well, it's emergent. We can't understand it, right? And so my lab is working hard on this. And, and given the opportunity to either run alone or, or walk, in a, in a group, my lab is doing their very best to sprint as a group. Um, and so, so I want to pivot now, and in the spirit of sort of this open, uh, sort of collaborative environment with Alan, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move from data and give you kind of a, I'm never going to do this again. This is a bit of an intimate insight into, a time, into my lab, right? Um, because I thought this might be interesting to the people working here. So here we are 16 months ago. I showed up, and they were like, yeah, we'll have the lab ready for you. Okay. It's concrete, folding chairs, drywall. 
So, so since then, I've assembled a team, and I, I should say not my lab, I should say our lab, because the, 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 the 10 people who have, for whatever reason, signed up to work with me, they are my, 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 my heart, my soul, my blood for the last 16 months, and what they have built is, in my mind, staggering and unprecedented. So the, 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 the pulse of the lab is derived from this deceptively simple looking recording chamber. So here we have a mouse, there's usually two, and the mouse has some data streaming out of its brain. And in this, we can track individual neurons from anywhere from say, I don't know, a traditional 16 or 32 channel array up to 640 from one to 10 implantation sites. And we can already do this for months continuously without stopping. We have complete control and monitoring of all environmental variables that this mouse is exposed to. So sound, light, temperature, humidity, et cetera. Uh, and then we have high frame rate video, uh, high definition video also, the, so we can sort of begin to deconvolve spontaneous high dimensional naturally occurring behavior with high dimensional neural dynamics. And, 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 and I, I spent a lot of time as a postdoc recording one or two animals individually at, at a time, and, and these are long, long, long recordings. And so there wasn't much room to explore or be creative. And everything I did had to be incredibly carefully planned. And so I wanted to have more of a big science aspect. I wanted to give people room to run ambitious experiments or to tinker or to explore new results. So we scaled this up. And we scaled this up dramatically. So we use um, um, E-Cube uh, e e acquisition systems and servers, which are made by, by White Matter, a company here in Seattle. And they've been very generous in helping us establish the ability to currently we can run up to 25 animals simultaneously. Right now, we have two of these rig rooms that are outfitted with uh, 10,000 channels. And we're building a third at the, at the moment to, that, that will have an equal capacity. We have already run 15 animals simultaneously, and the system is working. We have a, a, an entire data pipeline. I have trouble believing it as I say it, and, and I, I, again, I have to say hats off to the, to the team that has put this together in my laboratory. So, so with that, though, we've also been very concerned, not just with like, turning up the amount of science and data that we can do, but I, I'm very concerned with the quality. Because if I'm offered a choice between a small data set that is right, that is accurate, it's very clean, versus a giant pile of you know, turd data, I'll take the former any day of the week. So then the question is, well, why not scale up clean data. So my lab is focused very much on the, on the actual intersection between the computer, right, our analysis pipelines, and the local mesoscale environment. That's the, the, the recording site of our electrodes. And so at the moment, we use three different electrode technologies. Check my time here. OK, I'm good. So the first is tetrodes. So tetrodes are the gold standard of extracellular, single unit, uh, uh, you know, in vivo electrophysiology. So here's an example of a tetrode. We don't use drives, right, because we want to follow the same neurons. So we can't go hunting, 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 record for a couple hours, hunt, hunt, hunt. So we have pretty good recordings on tetrodes. You can see you know, spikes that are edging up on 150, 200 microvolts here. And uh, this is 15 days in in primary visual cortex. I think it's in a mouse. Um, but Betsy in my lab started looking under the SEM at tips of tetrodes and realized that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to be, to be plucked in that tiny space. So she has spent months optimizing tetrodes. And now with Betsy's optimized tetrodes, we regularly get and maintain uh, 400 to 700 microvolt spikes with lower noise background. And this makes it incredibly easy to follow the same cell across weeks of recording. Right? So this is actually in the same animal. We build bundles of, say, 16 or 32 tetrodes, and we alter the different treatments of the tetrode within that bundle. So we, we, we can control for the type of implantation, the region of implantation, the amount of damage that we've done. And then we can do this consistently across animals and say, which treatments of the tetrode itself provide better data, more stable data? And then we can converge on that. Likewise, we also work with uh, 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 carbon fibers. So I should give a shout out to Greg Gichuntz down here. He's a fantastic graduate student at Harvard. If anybody's looking for a postdoc, I know he is, he is on the market. He developed this technology in Tim Gardner's lab, and no one has picked it up. So Greg and I work together to get this running in my lab. And the idea here is we take a four micron carbon fiber, we coat it in a, a, a biocompatible polymer, and then we fire sharpen the tips so that they're, they're atomically sharp. 
And these can, we've held neurons for a year with these because they do no damage. We see no microglial activation. We don't see sort of an ensheathment of the electrode over time. There's no change in the signal to noise ratio, largely because they'll track with the brain. They're hyper flexible. The, you know, the animal hits its head, and these don't induce some translational microtrauma to the local circuit. Um, further, when they hit a blood vessel, it turns out somebody at MIT showed this recently, they divert around that blood vessel, so they don't seem to break the blood-brain barrier. So, so um, we call this Mark's, Mark's mouse because it's inspired by Mark. Um, I asked the guys yesterday to say, hey, can you quickly send me some data from Mark's mouse? It's been running basically since SFN. We, we dropped some electrodes in the retrospinal cortex, and we have robust, beautiful recordings. They're stable. But the cool, cool thing that I'm very excited about right now with this carbon fiber technology is that stochastically, some number of these seem to go intracellular. So they're, 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 again, they're basically like tiny little flexible sharp electrodes. And so what we see here is that for almost four days, we held an inter, what appears to be an intracellular recording, and we're verifying this in our patch rig with the carbon fibers, and we see sort of state-dependent changes in what the thing does and some shifts in its shape, and then we lose it after four days. But I'm working with a condensed matter physicist to see if we can scale up this technology and actually grow these electrodes. And if we can do that, we can start moving into the tens of thousands of electrodes, which would then stochastically provide, I don't know, a hundred simultaneous intracellular recordings in a freely behaving animal for days. So that's a bit of science fiction, but we're trying, and we're working on it. Oh, I gotta speed through this. Okay, so we have our own sort of alternative or complement to neuropixels. I work with uh, Tim Blanche, again from this uh, white matter group here in, in Seattle, Ed Boyden, and Ed Boyden's sort of magic hands, Jorg Schalvin, to produce instead of a single shank with 384 channels, we produce much smaller shanks with 64 active channels, and we can implant using the white matter system um, up to 10 of these at a time in a freely behaving mouse. That's my cue. Okay. So I removed any photos of a mouse, but this is what the thing looks like. Here is one of the white matter head stages. This is 1.6 grams. I can't remember if this is 256 or 300 something channels, but it's the size of, the, of my, my, my pinky fingertip, right? So we can, we can easily outfit these animals with up to 640 channel, channels on a mouse. Here's a, an electro tip. You can see this, these are very, very small. We've actually reduced the size of the wire bond so we can squeeze a lot more of these into a, a closed system, right? So you can look at you know, LGN, V1, V2, sort of the visual stream type of thing. The data from these recordings are sort of insurmountably large. So Kieran and Sam in my group have developed AI-based methods to track and analyze these data because you, we, we can generate 20 terabytes a day and we go continuously for months. So data storage alone is a monster, but pro processing is its own beast. So this is 230 something units. It's not the total, but it's a subset that we collect from these animals. So then their goal is to begin deconvolving those higher order network dynamics with behavior. And so Sam sent this to me last week. Um, he has started using a machine learning AI based tracking of the animal. So we can track you know, 10 or 11 dimensions of the animal at a time, sort of in high frame rate video continuously. And then we can cluster those data and those data actually map onto specific behavioral states. And this will require a lot of work going forward to refine it, but the animals sort of pretty lazy, right? So this blue onion in the center seems to be various positions of not doing much. And then over here, uh, this red cluster represents um, the motion in a certain direction in the cage at a certain speed that is simultaneous with a lateral head rotation, All right? So Sam can start algorithmically pulling these out and then mapping this back on with, I mean, technically we have nanosecond precision in the matchup between the video and the electrophysiology. So let me wrap up by saying, this is our lab now we have a kind of a Star Trek style hull, this control center. We can, we can watch thousands of channels of, of data stream by. We have, we have feedback about the status of the network at all time. We have live tracking of the animal video going on. And we have control over all of this remotely as well. And what we really want to do is, is inspired very directly by the Allen Institute. We want to take all of this, once it's processed and clean and we trust it, and I would like to find a way to, to give it to the world. And that might mean converging on neurodata without borders and somehow figuring out a way to host this and unleash it to, to the community. So um, these guys, I, I, need to, I need to give credit. The, these, these, these folks have done all of the work in, in the last 16 months to go from that, that concrete slab to, to what I've shown you. Um, I can't speak highly enough about them. These are my collaborators at WashU. So Ralph Wessel is a theoretical physicist, and Zheng Yu is his uh, graduate student. Um, she did a lot of the math and the coding for this work. She's also looking for a postdoc, and she's amazing. I would wish she would stay with me. She won't. Um, and then these are my collaborators at, uh, at other institutions, and I need to also thank them, because I, I, I am not a 
I don't know, uh, a, a technologist. I can't create these things alone. So I guess with that, I'm out of time, and I will take any questions. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. Um, I have a quick question about the future of this uh, technology. So how how you think about, you know, use other kind of basically attach some kind of like a miniature to imaging device, you know, um, to replace the touch Um Okay, so, so just to be clear, so your question is, do I see a transition from electrode-based recordings to imaging in time? I, I, I mean, ideally, Ideally, right? I mean, if you, if you could actually image. So my, my problem with current imaging techniques is the, the, the duration with which you can actually do the recording or the temporal resolution. Because I think we have evolved to have millisecond timing spikes for a reason. So if we're looking at the system on, you know, at best, 30 millisecond time scales, we're blurring the actual level at which information is encoded. So the reason that I'm starting my lab up based on these methods is because I think this is where we can actually analyze what's happening. Now, if voltage indicators, for example, get better, and they probably will in the next decade, and I could follow tens of thousands of neurons with spike timing precision indefinitely and not bleach the signal, then yeah, I'd love to dive into that. But right now, I don't think that that exists. Thank you, that was beautiful. Um, I'd Thank like you. to ask you, as you are moving to these chronic multi-unit uh, 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 recordings, yep. Uh, how you're going to test the sort of criticality hypothesis beyond the size and duration of events. So in particular, whether you're going to go in and actually interrogate information transmission and how that becomes more or less efficient uh, under perturbation such as deprivation. Uh, how do you really make that into an information processing hypothesis beyond the statistical observations of the dynamics? So, so I, I think that the statistical observations are obviously an important first step. That, that until we actually understand the parameters of how the system operates and the fact that we can push it and perturb it and watch it self-organize around there gives, I guess, momentum to the idea that this actually represents a self-organizing attractor for the network. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we can start to manipulate this. It would be fantastic if optogenetic or chemogenetic manipulation of certain cell classes, you know, genetically identified subclasses of interneurons, gives us control over higher order network dynamics without just inhibiting a region. And so that's something that uh, Sam Brunwasser, uh, I'm gone, Sam Brunwasser, a graduate student in the lab, is actively working on. Um, additionally, there, there, are, there are other models of network organization besides criticality that we want to interrogate with similar methods. So I guess this goes, this goes on YouTube, so I don't want to get too specific with what some of our plans are. But we, we do have methods and we do have plans to go in and try to causally interfere with the system and try to understand the, the cellular molecular components that give rise to, to this organization. And there is some research to suggest that, um, this is from Ralph Wessel's lab, that during stimulation and during sort of active engagement with the visual stimuli, the uh, topology of the network shifts in a, in a, in a sort of a stimulus-dependent fashion. And so with that in hand and tools to manipulate the system, I think we could probably make some progress on this. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, right here. Oh. Hey. Oh. Hi. So um, in the beginning of your talk, you uh, mentioned that uh, uh, information processing is seems to work best at gain equals one. And I'm just wondering if you're thinking about that as a um, simplification for explanation, or you think the brain is actually operating in a gain equals one type regime? Because it seems that as far as a, from a decision-making perspective, where we take external input and convert it into uh, motor movements, there's actually a, a nervous system as an, as an amplifier. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'd have, to, I'd have to think about that answer very carefully before we could, we could get into it, because it all sort of taps into philosophical things. But, but, but off the top of my head, I, I will bet that the quantification of sort of the mean gain in the network depends on time scale, and that the system can rapidly modify itself. And that probably explains, I mean, why we need to use these like large time bins to, to, to assess that the gain is equal to one. Because if we look at rapid time bins and smaller numbers of neurons, you will see different patterns emerge. And so I don't know the answer to that question. But my guess is that it depends on subsets of neurons and slices in time. 
Um, kind of like the, the average firing rate being stable. Obviously, it's not true when you look at a millisecond time scale, right? Otherwise, encoding would, there, there would be no encoding. So you have to look at a large enough time bin to even assess that something is stable. Um, and, and, that, and that probably applies as you scale out from the individual neuron as well. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but that's the best I've got right now. That was uh, really beautiful and amazing. So, <laughs> Thank you uh, very much. But I'm wondering about the nature of the activity because as you showed in the activity maps of the mouse, most of the time the mouse is just sitting, sitting around. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, a lot of the activity you're looking at is kind of like a spontaneous activity, like something like up and down states in the network propagating through, through the brain. Um, so I'm a little um, curious about the word information processing. Is the, do you view this spontaneous activity as processing information, or is it just when you connect a lot of neurons together, they're going to generate spontaneous activity, and it really doesn't have an information processing role? I, I guess that depends then on, on what you define as information processing, because there's information flowing through that network, whether or not it's in uh, a sort of an ethologically relevant, stimulus-driven manner, or if it's just internal processing of something. I mean, there is, there is you know, changes in entropy. They're moving through this network at a time, and so. So the, would you the, say my, my, my leg twitching is information processing? What's that? If my leg is twitching, is my muscles doing information processing? If it's driven by your brain, yeah. There's, there's a signal that contains information no, it's, it's, going it's to your leg. It's spontaneously excitable tissue generating spontaneous twitching. Is that... So now you're asking if there's noise in the system. That right? Basically, yeah. I'm asking when, when you use the word information processing, it conjures up a very particular idea, and uh, I'm... I'm just a little curious about your ideas about that. Uh, so again, I guess that, that, that ends up becoming a philosophical question. So um, I, I, I think that the, the, the activity flowing through a network has different contents depending on the state of the animal and what it's doing. And so the, 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 the advantage of the system then is if we can record for six months, we can look at you know, 600,000 examples of the animal grooming or approaching a water bottle or sitting in quiescence. So we can start to actually start to define with high resolution and solid statistical you know, weight, how these networks shift between these, these regimes. And so I, I, I will say we should talk after, because I think that there are feedback processes of brain states on higher order dynamics. And I have evidence for that, and I'd like to show that to you one on one. But I think brain state does play a distinct role here, and the types of information moving through those networks change in a state-dependent and behavior-dependent manner. So is it information? I think it is. Is it behaviorally relevant information? Not necessarily. Otherwise, it's noise. That's my take. Oh, my phone's in airplane mode. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have more questions or time. We have time for one more. Somebody's got one. Oh, Sean's here. Very nice. So this is a fairly specific question. Um, so during the, the first part, the monocular uh, deprivation, um, you don't see a change in mean firing rate right away. Um, Correct. What, what are the changes in the higher order correlations, so pairwise correlations, that would account for the change in the um, your DCC measure? So I, I'll, I'll first start by saying that the, the reason that there isn't a pass, it's not a passive drop, right? I mean, it's not like we, we, we you know, cover, cover one eye and immediately firing rates drop. It's not just a reflection of stimulus. Um, is that something changes in the organization of the network and that drives LTD. So this is sort of um, Hainan, Bayer work. And the question of how the network's changing to do that, I think, is less to do with pairwise correlations. All the data that I showed are from regular spiking units or putative pyramidal cells. And when we look at the dynamics of interneurons, they do change very rapidly. And so all of our modeling suggests that it's changes in interneurons and mechanisms in interneurons that actually sculpt the sort of network topology of the you know, putative excitatory cells in the network. Um, and, and I know Juliana Georgiova and Gina Trigiano have taken these data sets and began, begun to look at the sort of uh, temporal aspects of changes in things like pairwise correlations. And I'm not sure if that's published yet, but it's on its way out. So there are a lot of rate independent shifts in the network organization. M my gut instinct is that it's largely driven by subclasses of inhibitory interneurons that are actually sort of uh, 
shaping and destabilizing this architecture. Does that help? Okay. Great, well thank you Keith for that wonderful talk. Anytime.